Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome everyone, wherever you are. Uh, you are now viewing the webinar series from uh, the Center for Global Asia at NYU Shanghai. Uh, my name is Selena Hong, uh, Assistant Professor of Literature and the Center's Interim Director for this academic year. Uh, today's event is the second of our webinars uh, year long uh, on Global Asia. Now, let me just give you a quick preview on our programming. Upcoming in November, we have talks on topics including the Mongol history and Trans-Pacific Sinophone culture in media and literature. Uh, more events to come as well in December. So let me encourage you all uh, to stay tuned to the events channel of our website, Center for Global Asia at NYU Shanghai for our regular updates. Uh, today, it is our pleasure to host this distinguished lecture viewing mocha from sea, air, and land by Professor Nancy Ung as part of the center's multi-year research project on port cities environments in global Asia, which is funded by the Henry Luce Foundation. Uh, this talk will be moderated by Tan Sen, the director of our center, who is also a professor of history at NYU Shanghai and a global network professor at NYU. Uh, let me now welcome and turn the floor to Tan Sen, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Selena, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining uh, this webinar uh, and Haoja and Ming Ming for organizing this and Nancy for uh, willing to give this talk uh, this uh, morning in Shanghai late in the night uh, in, in uh, New York. Um, I'll introduce uh, Nancy uh, and, and also the program of uh, this Henry Luce Foundation lecture series that we have. Um, the, the Henry Luce uh, uh, provided us a New York, Abu Dhabi, and Shanghai with funds to do research on port cities and Indian Ocean, looking more on how Asian uh, polities interacted and how people move from one place to another. Uh, Shanghai, uh, NYU Shanghai in particular, has been looking at port cities. Uh, and, and the relevance of that, this talk is to port cities, uh, and we are covering different places of the Indian Ocean. This is actually our third uh, Henry Luce uh, Indian Ocean lecture, uh, and I'm delighted that Nancy Um uh, is going to give the lecture this, this semester. We had hoped that she would come to Shanghai, uh, but uh, maybe in the future she would be here uh, and join us in another event. Uh, Nancy uh, Um is a professor of art history at Binghamton uh, at State University of New York. She is also the associate dean, uh, and she has done lots of work on the visual culture, material culture uh, of the Red Sea area, the Persian Gulf area, publishing two books uh, in particular, uh, The Merchant Houses of Mocha, uh, Trade and Architecture in the Indian Ocean, uh, was her first book that came out from University of Washington in 2009. Her more recent work is on um, shipped but not sold material culture and social order of trade during Yemen's age of coffee. So you see she uh, is interested in coffee. I don't know if she drinks coffee or not, uh, but she has been looking at uh, different places that deal with coffee or are named uh, with a coffee like mocha. Uh, she has received a number of fellowships, um, uh, including uh, Getty Foundation, uh, and American Institute of Yemeni Studies. Um, and uh, her work, I think many of you perhaps already know, uh, but she'll be talking for about 45 minutes uh, and that will be followed by q and A. I'll be monitoring the Q&A. Uh, there's a Q&A box uh, in, the, in the web uh, place down there and then you can put the questions, write your questions and I'll ask the questions to Nancy uh, on your behalf. Um, I should mention one more thing. Uh, Nancy's uh, talk today is also the keynote address for a workshop that we are doing. Uh, it started yesterday. It's on Indian Ocean port cities, uh, mostly uh, young scholars uh, publishing uh, recent uh, research uh, or, or doing recent research are, are presenting in that uh, workshop. Uh, so it's in that context that Nancy is also providing leadership uh, to the young uh, scholars who are participating in the, in the workshop. Finally, I'll just add one more thing. If after the pandemic, uh, you end up in Doha, in Qatar, and you are looking for a place to eat, uh, ask Nancy. She knows all the good restaurants 
uh, in the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea area. So Nancy, thank you. And please, you can share your screen. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, I will start by saying good evening uh, because it is nighttime here in New York, but I will also say good morning because I know it's morning for many of my colleagues in Asia. In fact, this is the first time that I have ever delivered a paper simultaneously in two, on two days at the same time. So it's a career first for me um, and I'm very excited to be speaking in this forum. And I would just like to start by thanking Tan Sen Sen for offering me the kind invitation to uh, speak uh, and to deliver this lecture. Uh, I've come to realize that Tan Sen is the glue that holds together so many colleagues who work in Indian Ocean Studies, um, and so I'm very grateful for his uh, kindness and collaboration. I'd also like to thank the terrific staff at the Center for Global Asia and the organizers of this conference, Selena Hung, Elke Papalitsky, Ming Ming Li, Mei Jin Zhu, and Hao Zhe Li. Uh, I've been extremely impressed by the professionalism of the center and uh, I'm just grateful for all of the efforts in putting this lecture together. So today I'm going to be sharing a project with you that I, I will be kind of thinking about and talking about as one of my pandemic projects. And by that, I just simply mean that I began it late last year. And then when we in New York went into a, an extreme state of lockdown, I continued to work on it. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, the projects that I was working on during that period, which was really a time of just great isolation and extreme immobility, provided in some ways circumstances to think differently about the work that I was doing. Um, and so all of the projects that I was work working on during that time, I think, um, will come out very differently than they would have had I been working um, in a different atmosphere and a different time. And so one of the outcomes is that I've been asking different kinds of questions. And indeed today I'm going to be starting with a question that is perhaps, at least for me, a bit uncharacteristically open-ended. And that is simply, what are we looking at when we look at an image of a port city? And I ask this question with the awareness that not everyone in this group may be as interested in working with visual imagery as I am as an art historian. But at the same time, I'm quite confident in saying that I'm certain that all of us in this group have looked at images of the various port cities that concern us. And I want to remind you that of course, maps are images as well. And even if this question might have a fairly unassuming character, the answer that I will be endeavoring to deliver to you will be more complicated. And I will be asking us to all think about port city views located within webs of relationships situated between city spaces, texts, and other images. And we're going to do this by looking at the case of a single port city, that of Mocha on the Red Sea coast of Yemen, which uh, Tansen has already mentioned. This is um, a city that was a very important early modern Indian Ocean maritime center, and indeed a city that I have worked on quite extensively um, in my previous writings. And I'll be showing you several pictures of Mocha today, but I'm really going to be focusing on two that I'm going to be pairing together to try to make points about the ways in which we think about the kind of visual labor that these images might carry out. So let's just jump in with this first view that you see here on the screen. And this is a classic image of Mocha that dates to the mid 17th century. It was produced by the painter and engraver Adrian Janssen Matten, who worked in both Harlem and The Hague in the, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, we will be looking at this image mostly in its format as a single print, as you can see here on the screen. But it is important to state that it was originally published to sit between the covers of a book. It was in fact produced as a plate to illustrate the published journal of the merchant Peter van den Broek, who was a very prominent VOC or Dutch East India Company merchant who had undertaken a series of journeys to West Africa beginning in the year 1604 and then led the first Dutch journey to Yemen in the year 1614. He ended up going to Yemen a total of three times. He also served as the first chief of the Dutch factory in the city of Surat in India in 1620. And he returned to Holland again in the year 1630. And it was then that he quickly set about getting his journals published. And then he left for Asia again, and he died in Malacca in the year 1640. And so this journal that you see on the screen really serves as the main record of his legacy as both an intrepid traveler and a faithful servant of the VOC 
And you can see that we began by tethering this image to Fundenbrook, as well as to his particular journey of 1616, which is when he resided in the city of Mocha temporarily. In terms of the larger context, these are the years of the early years, rather, of the VOC, a moment when both the Dutch and the English were scrambling to establish themselves in Indian Ocean ports in competition with each other, both endeavoring to fill the waning of power that was left by the um, uh, uh, by the disappearance of the Portuguese, or let's say the waning of power of the Portuguese, rather. Uh, locally, this was also the first period of Ottoman rule in Yemen. So it was the provincial Ottoman governors of Mocha who had to cope with these new arrivals. And we should, of course, remember that the Dutch appeared in ships that were quite heavily armed and with reputa a reputation for great and uh, even indiscriminate violence. So it is not surprising that those local governors were quite suspicious of the motives of these new arrivals. And it's one more facet that I think is important to underline. This was also the time when the Dutch publishing industry was expanding rapidly. And it was catered really to two different audiences. First, the group of uh, merchants and sailors who aspired to follow in the footsteps of someone like Peter Fundenbroek, but also those who never intended to get on a boat, but were becoming increasingly interested in faraway places like Mocha that were becoming more and more part of the Dutch worldview. And so the book that we're looking at on the screen was produced at the intersection of those various developments. So Mattam, our artist, produced 12 illustrations of Fundenbrook's travels for this publication. But it's important to state from the outset that Mattam never visited Mocha himself. And of course, this was not unusual at all at this time, as I've just described. There was an increasing market for books in Holland. And so artists were being called upon to uh, render places that they had certainly never visited, perhaps even places that they had never heard of. Um, and so uh, indeed, Mattam was put in this position with this uh, particular set of images. But still, it is worth asking, what then did Mattam base this image on? Well, it is clear to me that he had access to the uh, manuscript that would be published. And by the way, that manuscript sits today in the library of Leiden University. Um, and I know this not because Mattam left any detailed records about the way that he worked, but rather just by looking at the image itself, in which we can see that Mattam is giving physical form to certain features that Fundenbrook describes in his text, although I will add that his text is quite sparse in its description, it was not very detailed, and so in many ways Mattam was forced to really fill in some of the gaps that were left. And to give you an example of this, uh, Funderburg describes the fact that small boats would bring people and goods in from the larger ocean going vessels that you see in the foreground of this image. Um, but Matam has uh, circled these little boats around the jetty that uh, extended from the center of the city. Funderburg mentioned that there was a small fort located in the northern part of, city, of the city, and Matam rightly placed it, in fact, on this northern spit of land that jut out from the coast of Mocha and pointed back toward the shore. And indeed, the harbor of the city was crescent-shaped, and you can get a sense for that by looking at uh, the details of the shoreline. Matt, uh, Funderburg talks about planting the flag of the uh, United Provinces on the house that would serve as a temporary Dutch factory during this season. And you can note that Mattam rightly places that flag on a building in the northern part of the city, which is indeed where the Dutch lived uh, during that season and frequently actually resided in when they would come to Mocha. So you can see how this image on one hand depicts the text that it was meant to accompany while also exceeding it. And this leads us to surmise that there were other notes and maybe even sketches that had been made available to this artist. And I should also add that Mattam and Fundenbrook, we know, were actually socially acquainted with each other. So it may have been that Fundenbrook conveyed certain details to him um, in ways that have not been preserved for us. But then in other cases, Mattam just diverged from the text that he was illustrating. For instance, Fundenbrook described that there were three mosques in the city of Mocha. However, he specifies very clearly that only one of them, the central one, had a minaret. And by the way, this is the mosque of Eshadili, who was a patron saint of Mocha and lived there in the early 15th century. And indeed, some of you may be familiar with Sheikh Eshadili because he is frequently identified as the originator of the habit of coffee drinking. But so you can see that Mattam has added on um, a minaret to this building as well, which is the Basque, Basque of Esandal, which sits on the coastline and still stands today. 
And then there were other cases where Ma uh, Matam used his own visual knowledge to uh, really override some facets of the text that Fundenbrook provided him with. Uh, so for instance, that Northern Fort that we just looked at on the left side of the image, Fundenbrook described it as a round tower, but you can see that he has depicted this building along with the buildings um, or the little shelters that sit on the roofs of some of the houses that you can see also highlighted. Um, they all appear with the pointed gabled roofs that you might imagine to find on a Dutch house. So in this case, Matam is just simply relying upon his own architectural knowledge and using it to draw upon for this rendering of these particular features. And so I hope you're starting to see how Matam had to refer to various points of reference in rendering this image of Mocha. Um, and indeed, you may be starting to question the accuracy of this image. Um, and some of my colleagues, I will say before me, have tried to treat images like this one as veritable snapshots of the city of Mocha. Um, and I think you can see why that is not really a tenable position. But I will say you, tell you that less um, than accuracy, or rather more than accuracy, I'm much more interested rather in the differential nature of the knowledge that has informed this image. And indeed, when you take a look at it and you uh, really don't know anything about the city, it's hard to really get a sense of the places from which some of this knowledge has come. And indeed, everything that is conveyed to you in it might appear to be quite natural or in fact, quite neutral. But when you begin to take it apart, you understand that all of these features, in fact, need to be weighed on independent terms. We must also recognize that the image on the screen is absolutely generic. In fact, it is rendered in a formula that Matam used to render all of the Arabian Sea ports that appear in this same volume. And we can see this with Surat on the upper left, Hormuz on the upper right in uh, the Gulf, and Surat is in India, uh, Aden in Yemen as well on the lower left. And all four of these images, when shown together, um, uh, along with the image of Mocha, give you a sense of this replication. Each one is oriented horizontally, with the city building stretching across the vista, filling out the horizontal width with a built-up segment of the city contained within the frame. The skylines of all of them are punctuated by minarets, that so we've already seen how minarets could be added in at will by this artist, who really saw these architectural features as markers of visual difference for these Arabian sea ports with their majority Muslim populations. Each one of these images shows the port city from a vista point located out in the sea or uh, across the river in the case of Surat. Um, and in each case, the distance from which this point is determined is really given, um, is really based on the size of the city. Those more expansive cities like the ones on the top are shown from further away. And those more compact cities on the bottom are shown from closer in. However, in each case, we see that a fleet of ships sits in the foreground. And in each case, the Dutch vessel or vessels with their striped tricolor flags waving are afforded a primary and extremely visible position among the other kinds of sea craft. And in each of these images, the horizon line cuts across the center of the page with the sky filling the top half. And you can see that they are also embellished by almost identical cloud and bird formations. And I'm aware that as I was walking through this, you may think that I was just kind of picking out some features that were quite ordinary. But indeed, one of my points in today's paper is that none of these features are automatic. In fact, they were all determined by the expectations and the anticipations that of the particular audience that was going to receive these, as well as, of course, of the artist himself. Um, and many of these cultural aspects were really determined by the book industry at this time. And my suggestion really is that these images belong to a fixed genre of rendering the Arabian Sea port that Matin deploys, and I would even say that he played a role in founding and solidifying, and that this genre points back to itself as much as it can tell us anything specific about any one of these distant cities. And indeed, whenever you are going to look at one of these images of a port city that comes from the 17th century Dutch context, um, although I would even extend that in terms of both chronology and geography, um, you should understand that these images really are situated in a constant push and pull between urban specificity and the powerful and repetitive conventions of the genre that they were situated in, which was certainly on the rise in the 17th century with a proliferation of these books that I've already described. 
Um, and so I think that you've probably realized that I have relinquished any expectation that Matthew's prints should or could serve as records of urban space or form in the case of Mocha, but also these other cities as well. But that doesn't mean that we should just simply discard these images. It means that we should tell a different story about them. And in fact, the more interesting question in regard to Matthew's uh, print on the um, bottom right is really how it was disseminated, how it circulated, and how it spurred on a new lineage of images that each sustain a complicated relationship to the city of Mocha. And let me get into some of the details here. And I'll remind you that Vandenbroek's uh, text was issued in print in the year 1634 by two different printers, one in Harlem and the other in Amsterdam. It was then reissued quickly and successively in many different forms and venues, which are worth reviewing briefly. And I will tell you that some of my colleagues have looked particularly at the um, transformations that took place with the text of Matin, excuse me, of Vandenbroek's text uh, and narrative, but very few of them have thought about the images and the kind of lineage of these images, which is what I will be highlighting right now. So as early as the year 1645, about 10 years after Vandenberg's text first appeared, the Dutch historian and publisher Isaac Komelin reprinted Vandenberg's text, this time in a compendium of accounts that canonized the early Dutch voyages to the East called The Beginning and the Progress of the VOC. And this was produced at a time when the VOC was already beginning to, uh, to uh, uh, present great profits, um, and it was deemed to be um, appropriate to issue an official institutional history of this company. And you can see that the image of Mocha that we've been looking at appears here, along with the other 11 original illustrations that appeared in the uh, earlier volumes. Um, and it appears that this print uh, was was uh, made from the same plate that was used for those earlier volumes um, with only a slight modification. And I will say it was very common for publishers to uh, buy and sell plates to each other because of course it's cut down on costs as well as the time to produce their books. Then just a few years later, Komelin's text was adapted and expanded by another publisher whose name was Joost Hartgers. And Hartgers published this compendium and at the same time issued some of the journeys in separate volumes. And in this case, Funden narrative appeared under a new and much more celebratory name, here called the Wondrous Historical and Journal Account that replaced its much more modest original title. And it's clear that the image of Mocha uh, now has come from a new copper plate. You can see that, first of all, it's a lot smaller than the other image. Um, and it is also compressed into a square format. And you can note that it is, in fact, combined with the other views that we looked at in, in addition to one more. Um, and the six of them were put together in a frontispiece that folded out. And this was the only illustration in the book. Um, and what's important to understand here um, is the way that this print was produced. In most cases, when you are going to render a print of an image, you etch the plate in reverse so that when you make the impression, the image will appear in its proper orientation. In this case, I think you can see that the, the plate that was etched was actually um, etched as a direct replica from the original. And so what happened when it was impressed, you can see that it was actually flipped horizontally. And so that little spit of land that we were looking at that used to be on the left side of the image is now on the right side of the image. And indeed, this method of producing the plate was probably a lot faster and just a kind of shortcut that was taken for this volume. Then in the year 1665, yet another version of this uh, journal appeared. Um, and you can see that the image that came out um, in the last text uh, is, uh, uh, or rather uh, that, same, uh, that same rendering also appears um, in the 1665 journal. Um, but rather than being included with those other views, Mocha appears alone. It is embedded within the text rather than being um, a part of a frontispiece. And there's some decorative woodblock printing on both both sides as well. And indeed, in this case as well, this narrative appeared in a larger compendium as well as being issued individually. And uh, the kind of number of reprintings here in this short period of time should really give you a sense that, again, there was just a great audience for this kind of text. 
Mocha appeared again in print in the year 1680. And this was in a publication by Olfert Dapper, who wrote several books about Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and the Pacific. And this book was fundamentally different than the ones that I've just shown you, in, the, in that all of those were simply reprintings of foundational first-hand narratives like Fundenbrook's. Um, Dapper had a very different mission. He desired to take the new information that was coming in from um, overseas and to integrate it with older viewpoints, such as the one that was delivered by Fundenbrook. But he was also interested in reconciling these views with the perspective of classical authors. And so if you are to read Dapper's works, I would suggest that you do so with a great deal of caution because they are very unevenly referenced and they include major anachronisms because he does not take into account change over time. But in many ways, Ways, it's just really interesting to think about how Dapper's work represents a very different impulse, the desire to start reconciling all of this growing body of knowledge that is coming into the Low Countries from these overseas areas. And all of Dapper's works were copiously illustrated with original images. Uh, it's worth noting that his publisher was the Amsterdam um, printer Jacob van Moers, who was quite famous for issuing popular volumes about the non-Western world. And some of the members of the audience audience might be familiar with his most famous work, which is, of course, Johann Neuhoff's work on China from the late 17th century. And in this case, we do not know the name of the engraver, but it is clear that he was indebted to Matten, as the basic features of that earlier print are replicated in this later image. But there are some differences that certainly seem to be drawn from some of these new sources that Dapper was relying upon. So if we just start again with this northern fort, you can see that it is shown here much differently than it was rendered in Matten's original image. Um, here it is shown as four-sided and much more um, um, uh, resilient and strongly built than um, Matam's version. And indeed, this lines up with the way that the fortifications in Mocha are described in the text. Here on the right, you can see that there's this um, kind of island that is placed on the southern part of the city. And indeed, it is described that there also was this little spit of land that uh, jutted out of the city from the south that would become an island during high tide. I um, mean, so this may be referring to that. But I also have a strong suspicion that the artists in this case had seen those images that were flipped in their orientation that we just looked at and was trying to kind of reconcile that point of view with this rendering, even though we understand that that particular feature was simply the result of a printing idiosyncrasy. There are, in this case, two flags in the city, not just the Dutch one, but the one in the middle is the English flag. And this really draws from the fact that a lot had changed in Mocha by the late 17th century. Indeed, the Ottomans that had ruled that city had been ousted in the 1630s. And now Yemen was being ruled by a family called the Qasimi Imams who ruled from the highlands. And they were generally much more amenable to having foreign merchants living on the coast, which indeed led to a much more stable situation for both the Dutch and the English. So we can see that the flag waving here certainly points to some of those changed circumstances in the city, although I will tell you that none of them aren't necessarily mentioned in the text. In fact, Dapper still anachronistically refers to Mocha as an Ottoman city, drawing back from um, Fundenbrook and other earlier texts. Our minarets have continued to increase in number, and we see the addition of new architectural features. And I will point out particularly the low wide domes that you can see across the city, and the one minaret in the center that is conical in shape, that is a pencil minaret. Um, and the reason I think these are important because it is clear to me that the artists had been looking at images of Ottoman cities and had inserted some of those characteristic features into this rendering. And of course, this would have made sense to that artist because again, uh, the uh, text, Dapper's text, referred to Mocha still as an Ottoman site. And we can see that the uh, image roughs up the seas uh, considerably. And I should just note that at this time, the marine painting tradition was on the rise and firmly established um, in, uh, in Holland. And so those uh, paintings that had very dynamic seas may have had an impact on this print and the way it represents the waters, but still, our Dutch ship with its striped flag waving is given a central place among um, all the other vessels.
And so this whole kind of lineage of images, I hope uh, you will see, really exemplifies what the historian Benjamin Schmidt has rightly referred to as the tenuous correlation between circulated knowledge and its shifting points of origin, which he identifies as a key feature of the Dutch publishing industry at this time. Um, and even further, I'm uh, a bit more interested in rather what this means for the dissemination of geographical knowledge. Um, and indeed, these images have circulated very widely and are often featured as illustrations of the ports that they represent. Um, and I've tried to really indicate for you here that indeed all of these images are in fact related to the cities that they depict, but their relationships to that city or the, you know, to the city of Mocha in particular here um, is quite uneven, extremely complicated, must be weighed along with the text within which these images sit as well as texts that go beyond the, uh, these books as well. Um, and they must be connected connected to a whole range of images, some of which we can identify and others of which we cannot. So um, Matam's view of Mocha, as well as some of its um, uh, those that have been derived from it, uh, constitute our first view of the city. And now we're going to move to this second view of Mocha, which as I've already indicated, I believe will pair effectively with this um, earlier print. And this is now a painting which brings us refreshingly much further east. It is a folio from a manuscript called Anis al Hojej, The Pilgrim's Companion, written by Safi ibn Veli, a Persian scholar who was based in India at a time when Persian emigres were highly valued as the arbiters of cultural sophistication at the Mughal court. And in this case, Zibin Nisa, the daughter of the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb, sponsored Safi ibn Vali, who was actually her tutor, to undertake the pilgrimage to Mecca in the year 1676 to 77. And in his manuscript, he documents his journey from Delhi to the port of Surat, and then from Surat into the Red Sea and into the region of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. And I'm showing you this map so that you can locate some of the sites that we have already looked at, such as Hormuz, Surat, Mocha, and Aden. Um, and also so that you can see how closely connected the cities of Mocha and Surat were. Indeed, these two cities constituted fixed nodes on a pilgrimage corridor. Pilgrims would embark on their ships in Surat which was literally called Beb, uh, Bebel Mecca or the gateway to Mecca because of its role in serving the traffic uh, toward that region. Um, and uh, they would uh, enter the Red Sea and they would often stop at Mocha on their way into the Red Sea or out of the Red Sea or in both directions. And indeed we have copious accounts that attest to the robust and continuous nature of this pilgrimage traffic during this period. And Safi ibn Vali wrote this travelogue while he was on his journey. So we believe that the text would have been completed by the time that he returned home in the year 1677. And this particular manuscript is in the Khalili collection in London. And I will tell you that it is one of three extant illustrated versions of this manuscript. Um, and I will also add that I have certain questions about, about the manuscript that I have not yet been able to resolve. In fact, um, I think it is uh, fair to say that I know much more about Funnenbrook text than I do about this one, um, but I still think it is worth bringing into communication um, into this comparison that I have um, that I have introduced. Um, and uh, just a few more words about this manuscript. Uh, we believe that it was copied and illustrated very soon after the text was completed. And so the dates I've given here are 1677 to 1680. And it has been proposed that it was copied in Gujarat, which is, of course, the coastal province where the city of Surat is located. The artist of this painting is anonymous. Even so, we can imagine that this artist, like Matam, probably never visited the city of Mocha and would have, like Matam, had to draw on the text of Vali's narrative in order to render the landmarks in the city. Of course, if this manuscript had been produced in and around the port of Surat, as has been uh, suggested as one possibility, that artist would have also had access to seafarers and returning pilgrims who could add additional information. But like Matam, the artist of this manuscript was also invested in conveying certain topographical and architectural details about the port of Mocha. For instance, the city's harbor is represented here uh, by a strip of gray blue water populated by ships. 
And if all of those Dutch prints were focused on featuring those Dutch ships, uh, always front and center, here we can see that we, uh, there are no European ships at all, but rather the ships in the harbor appear to be pilgrimage ships populated by passengers whose faces peek out in profile under the deck. The painting clearly marks out some of the key institutions of the port. The house of the governor, which is shown right here on the shoreline and was quite strongly built, along with the customs house of the city are the Furza, which was a requisite stopping place for all of those who arrived in the city by sea. This long arched hallway here in the eastern part of Mocha is not labeled, but it likely indicates the city's bazaar or souk that was located in the inland part of the city and indeed connected to one of the city walls uh, and indeed one of its gates. This painting also marks two of the religious structures in the city, and these are not marked by minarets as they had been in Matam's print, but rather by this icon of a triple arched hall topped with a green dome. And the one in the lower left marks the tomb of a Shadili, again the patron saint of Mocha. And you will remember that Matam marked the mosque of a Shadili with the minaret that you see there on the lower right. In fact, the two buildings, the tomb and the mosque, both dedicated to the same saint, sat adjacent to each other in the city. And Vali, not surprisingly, was much more interested in rendering the tomb of Shadli because of course, this was a, a narrative that was dedicated to the rites of visitation and veneration of Muslim pilgrims. So it only makes sense that he would be focused on that structure. Most European seafarers were very interested actually not in the mosque of Ashadali, but in the minaret of Ashadali. And the reason why is because they used it as a navigational device when they entered the harbor. The harbor of Mocha could be very dangerous. And so there was literally a set of rules about how you had to line up that minaret, the central minaret in the city in a very particular position before you turned into the harbor. Otherwise you could risk damaging your ship. In the upper part of the image, you can see that, that same icon, mar uh, which is just marked by the label Masjid or Mosque, renders the Mosque of Esandal, which indeed Matam also uh, re represented, as you can see on the right, with the minaret. Um, and I just want to note that both of these buildings, and in fact, all the buildings that are indicated in the city, are not rendered in a, uh, with uh, the kind of details that you would expect of Yemeni or Arabian Peninsula or Red Sea architecture. Rather, both of these buildings look as if they are constructed with marble and pietra dura, which is the architectural technique that we see most um, famously used at the Taj Mahal. The pink uh, color uh, is meant to represent uh, red sandstone, another very important building material used in northern India. And so you can see that this artist, perhaps like Matam, had to rely on some of his own familiar architectural references in order to fill out the details of this image. The walls of the city of Mocha are indicated by the ruled lines of the image block margin on the three landward sides of this city. Each one is punctuated again by a red gate, uh, again, perhaps uh, constructed of red sandstone. And I just want to note that when Vandenbroek arrived in Mocha in 1616, those walls were not yet built. And so he described it as an unwalled city, and that's the way that Matum represented it. But here, many years later, indeed, those, uh, those city walls were constructed, in fact, by the Ottomans, who tried to wall that city as one of their last efforts to hold on to it before they were eventually ousted from Yemen. Um, and so that is one uh, major topographical difference between those two periods. And then another major difference here is, of course, the human presence that um, the artist in this case has included people below the city. Blown up large in scale is a group of city notables that includes the governor of the city of the time, whose name was, whose name was Sayyid Hassan al-Jaramuzi, a historic figure who was in fact posted to the city uh, in this period. And so uh, I hope that you can see here that this painting um, can be lined up with these various details about the city of Mocha, which are topographically, spatially, and historically specific. Um, and in many ways, I'm trying to highlight the legibility of this image because I do understand that it might be harder to read for some of you. Um, and that indeed this image um, in many ways is meant to solidify Safi bin Vali's place as a historic witness to the city with these details, many of which again are labeled in Persian to really indicate what the viewer is looking at. 
And if we want to take this connection to Matthew's print even a little bit further, I would say that this painting also needs to be located within its genre. Indeed, the Anis al Hujaj is a pilgrimage guide that was intended to uh, provide some uh, directions for Muslim pilgrims as they navigated the sites of visitation and veneration in and around the holy cities. Um, and for this reason, the Anis al Hujaj should be compared to another, in fact, much more popular pilgrimage guide from this time called Fatu al Haramain, which is a, a poetic description of the holy cities that was uh, written uh, earlier than in Nisul Hujaj uh, and was also written by a Persian poet. And I should add that Fatou al Haramein that you're looking at here on the right was copied widely, uh, much more widely than in Nisul Hujaj. Um, and in fact, um, we know that copies of Fatou al Haramein were produced, literally churned out in the city of Mecca to serve as both guides and souvenirs for the pilgrims that would flood into that city for the uh, yearly pilgrimage. But it was also produced outside of the region in Istanbul, for instance, in Iran, in Central Asia, and also clearly in India, as you can see with the exemplar on the right. Um, and uh, when you look at Fatou al Haramein on the right, I do think it will help you to better understand uh, and even uh, further understand the legibility of the image on the left. Um, indeed, both rely on certain conventions of architectural representation that are very much uh, consistent across pilgrimage guides, particularly those that were produced in India at this time. In fact, they frequently used a composite projection approach to the representation of architecture. And in this, I mean that buildings are seen on one hand as if you're looking at them from the sky, from an aerial position, so that you can see their entire footprint. Um, but at the same time, certain features of those same buildings buildings are shown from the side uh, with the walls kind of splayed out so that you can see all of the arches and the minarets and the gates and the domes radiating either outward or inward. And by the way, the kind of effect of this particular kind of projection is that these two distinct and frankly incommensurable points of view, the aerial and the side view, are meshed together so that you can combine them and see them all together uh, without shifting your position. So I hope you can understand there, here on the left, how the Anis al Hujaj is deeply embedded within this long standing set of visual conventions, which were particularly resilient and long sustained in South Asian copies of Fatou al Haramein and indeed Anis al Hujaj. And I will tell you that if you look at uh, Ottoman examples of Fatou al Haramein from around the same time, they began to depart from these conventions and began to take on more of a kind of three dimensional view. Uh, but in the Indian context, again, there are quite resilient. But one of the main differences between the manuscript on the left and the one on the right is that the one on the right, again, is much better known and was copied just uh, many, many times, was extremely popular. Um, and the Anis al um, uh, had a very limited scope within India alone. Um, and to that end, uh, or as it actually is another kind of feature that really kind of uh, takes, uh, sets it apart, is that this is uh, the only pilgrimage guide that I have located that includes an image of the port of Mocha. And in fact, this is on the left, the only early modern non-European image of this port that I have been able to locate. And for that reason, it's quite special to me because indeed, as you've already seen, in the European tradition, Mocha was a, a really a quite popular topic. Uh, but within the context of the Indian Ocean, we do not see many renderings of it. Um, and in fact, this manuscript on the left includes not only Mocha, but also other important Indian Ocean ports, such as Surat on the left, Jeddah, um, uh, which is the port to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina in the middle, and uh, of course, Mocha all the way on the right. And in this way, this particular manuscript is a uh, uniquely Indian Ocean text. Um, and it really provides for us um, a kind of lesson to really think about the ways in which the port city can be represented. Indeed, again, kind of getting back to this question of genre, we see that all of them are vertically oriented and have painted the water along one of the long vertical edges. 
In each case, the ships are lined up in succession to signal these bustling harbors. And in each case, just like we saw with Mocha, the marginal lines are used to define the boundaries of the city, even if the gates sometimes spill out of the margins um, to the top and to the sides. Um, and in this way, these cities are kind of locked into these very tight linear structures, although we of course know that this, all three of these cities um, were indeed um, uh, very kind of distinct in terms of their shapes. None of them followed this distinctly rectilinear format. It is also worth underlying, worth underlying how different these port city views here in the Nice Rougege are from other paintings of this time. And here on the right, I'm mobilizing an image from the Petit Chaname, a, another 17th century Mughal painting that is slightly earlier than the Nice Rougege. Indeed, the painting on the right exemplifies an imperial tradition, whereas the one on the left uh, could possibly have come out of a commercial workshop. So they come from very different contexts. But I think that they come together very nicely to give us a sense of the options for the artist in representing port city views. On the right, we see the port city viewed from the perspective of a boat with a harbor full of, of, uh, of other ships, all of them with their flags waving. And indeed, we see that the city itself is depicted as a mass of domes and towers and buildings that recede off into the distance, far into the landscape. And indeed, this particular mode of rendering the port city, we have already seen with Matam's prints and the ones that were related to it, because indeed, the imperial Mughal painting tradition dating from the period of uh, Shah Jahan and before him, uh, like we see indicated on the right, uh, was very much in conversation with the European European print tradition. So it's no surprise it adopted from it this particular view of the port city. Um, but indeed, when we compare it to the Anissa Hujaj on the left, which also comes from uh, you know, this same 17th century period, um, also in northern India, we really get a sense that um, there was another way to depict the port city that very much diverged from this European oriented mode on the right. And the other thing I will very much note that I think comes into play when we look at the right and left images next to each other is the fact that none of those port city images included any representations of Europeans. And of course, particularly in the cities of Surat and Mocha at this time, Europeans were a constant figure um, uh, or you know, kind of uh, presence in um, both of those cities by the end of the 17th century. Um, and so it is, I think, notable that Adis Rougej has very much deleted and erased their presence um, in all of those port renderings. So in this talk, I have brought to you two 17th century illustrations of Mocha, both of which were embedded within travel narratives that were written during a time of increased interest in Red Sea travel, whether for trade or pilgrimage or both. When we pair these images in this way, I do believe that they help us to confront or perhaps kind of cope with some of our assumptions about the representations of the ports. And of course, I have made an assumption about the way that you're viewing these images, and I'll be interested to hear if you uh, disagree with me on this. But I do think that it is quite easy for us to look at the image on the right, Matham's print, and to accept it as a natural view of this port city. And for that reason, I had from the outset tried to work to undermine your sense of confidence in this image. At the same time, on the left, that image might appear to be a quite stylized image of the port city, which again, I think might be difficult for many of us as modern viewers to read, which is precisely why I tried to spend the time to highlight its legibility for someone who in fact is uh, uh, quite familiar with the shape of the city that was being represented. Uh, and so while these two images are very different in the approach that they have taken to the rendering of Mocha um, and in their appearance, certainly, I see both images, however, as motivated by comparable challenges. Neither of these artists visited the city of Mocha, yet they both were pushed to render aspects of the uniqueness of the city that they had to glean through other sources, namely a textual one, but perhaps others as well. And they had to do so while 
uh, staying true and consistent to the very confining conventions of the genres that governed their own artistic spheres. And so in both of these images, I see this comparable tension, again, between this kind of urban specificity and, again, the compelling kind of features of genre that were very much regimented by their workshop traditions. And so I do think as well that when we put these images together in this way, we can certainly unsettle the notion that Matham's image is closer to some kind of visual truth, simply because it is more legible, I would say, to most of us as modern viewers. I also hope to signal the impossibility of understanding any of these pictures outside of their relationships to texts, to images, and indeed to the cities that they represent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Q&A box is open. So if people uh, who are here want to ask questions, please type in uh, your questions there and I'll ask them on your behalf. I see some old friends here. Uh, uh, you have uh, uh, Himangshu there, uh, Veera is there, um, art historian, historians. Um, so if you want to ask any questions, please type in. Um, I don't think we we can allow you to speak up. Uh, can we hold Hauja? I would like to hear from Himangshu. Oh, we can try. Yes. Okay, Marina has a question before before uh, uh, before uh, Himangshu, I guess. Uh, and Vera, I would like you to ask a question as well. I see you there. So uh, Marina uh, uh, says uh, she has two questions. Uh, the first. Uh, has Professor Um encountered uh, representations of women at ports, uh, be that mocha or other visuals that she has worked with? Uh, this is uh, sp specific to Marina's own research. She is trying to find images of women in port cities. Uh, the second question she has is, does she know of any circulation of these different images beyond the primary audience for which they were intended from Turkey to Netherlands to India, et cetera. Okay. Thank you so much, Marina. Um, so, you know, this particular genre that we're looking at was quite unpeopled, as you can see with Matin's image. Um, but of course, uh, you know, one part of the uh, of these representations, and particularly representations of Mocha and the Middle East, um, were very much hinged upon, uh, especially from the European tradition, the fascination with the inaccessibility of local women. And this is, uh, you know, just a motif that we find in the writing where um, the, the European travelers who visit Yemen are just trying uh, to every extent to get a glimpse of the women in the city. And they are always foiled because the women usually uh, are um, not uh, trying to interact with them. Um, and when they do see them, they are covered up. And this is a, you know, a source of great frustration to them. And so in some ways, um, even when they do not appear, they are a motif because there's always this desire to have access to them, access which of course is denied to them very frequently. And so that's um, a very important part of uh, the representations of women in this part of the Indian Ocean. And this morning, of course, we heard um, you talk about uh, representations of women in other parts of the Indian Ocean, but particularly on the Arabian Peninsula, that is a common motif. Um, and in terms of the circulation of these images, I mean, particularly those Dutch prints, we know that they traveled very far and wide. And we do know that many of them, you know, we can't always say if the exact print actually ended up in, at the Mughal court, um, but we know that many like them did. And we know that books were often given as well as prints were given as gifts. Um, and so uh, these images, I think, had a very wide circulation. Um, and of course, prints travel much more easily than other forms of more durable uh, arts like painting and sculpture and things like that, um, even though we know that those kinds of formats were also circulated in the Indian Ocean. And so I think it's safe to say that those, uh, particularly the one, the European ones that I'm uh, talking about, uh, moved around a great deal. In terms of the um, Anis Rougege, what's really interesting about that one is that um, I described how there were three manuscripts that were illustrated. All of them remained in India until very recently. Two of them, one of them is in uh, Mumbai, the other is in 
Delhi, um, and one of them is in London. Um, and so those very, that particular manuscript was really limited to the South Asian context, which is so interesting because, again, you know, the two major pilgrimage guides, Futu al Haramain, which I talked about, and the Dala'il al Khairat, which I did not talk about, those just had an amazing circulation around, you know, reaching every corner of the Islamic world. So um, it's a little bit different than. Um, uh, uh, or let's say unique within that tradition um, in that way. So I hope I answered the question, Marina. Yeah, if not, you can ask uh, for clarification, Marina. Uh, the next question is actually from Himangshu, uh, Professor Himangshu Prabhare. You may know her writing on Indian Ocean. Uh, so she says, uh, do we get standalone images of port cities? Uh, since we do know that images as, as postcards are also circulated. Uh, how different are these standalone images? Hmm, that's interesting. I'm trying to think about this because, I mean, you know, often we see versions of the image, like the one, um, you know, the print that I started out with, uh, that I spent a great deal of time with, of course, of also was issued as a standalone image um, and was it was printed in a run actually um, after uh, after the uh, the plate was transformed um, for uh, printing uh, in the Comelin vo volume, and there were some single prints issued, um, but uh, so they were standalone. But again. It's a little bit, I think, misleading for us because if we, when we remove it from the book context, right, then we don't understand uh, what the intentions were. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of other examples, um, but we're really kind of largely, uh, you know, in terms of this particular set of interests uh, in the 17th century at this time, um, we're really working with a particular market, which was a reading market, right? Um, and these books were, you know, just really meant to kind of bolster the text in this way, while also, as you saw, sometimes diverging from them. So, um, uh, you know, I think that uh, even though there are some standalone images, I do think kind of tying them into that textual uh, location is really, really important because when they get uh, severed from them, and we often see today, and I mean, this is in many ways, I think one of the kind of dangers of the, you know, Google image search, right, is that we could pull these images up from wherever and we don't know where they came from. Um, and then um, as I've tried to show that then some of the uh, meaning really has been lost and it becomes really difficult to understand um, uh, what they were meant to do and to understand, in fact, um, uh, uh, really, uh, I think they're viewed in context. Uh, so uh, Nancy, uh, as we wait for other questions, um, let me ask you one. Uh, there seems to be a difference in perception uh, in the two kinds of paintings uh, from the West and from South Asia. Uh, one, if you see from the West, uh, the perspective is from the sea looking into the city, right? Uh, it seems that the maritime uh, aspect is important. Um, and the, the, the images, the drawings that you showed from Gujarat uh, and other places, uh, are essentially from the city and the sea is in the periphery, right? Um, does it indicate the context in which these people were in, encountering Indian Ocean port cities? Uh, of course, you mentioned that this person had not been to Mocha and was drawing through the text. Um, and and for, for him, then uh, the sea is perhaps not important because he has not seen the sea, right? Uh, for him, it's it's uh, the city that's important. So. Uh, uh, do these paintings uh, tell us how people encountered port cities uh, from the sea perspective and from the urban uh, city perspective? Yeah, you yeah, know that's a great question, and I will say, um, you know, I. I uh have been you know writing parts of this up and I think one of the premises that I was working with with um, uh, writing about uh, the uh, illustrations of the Anis al Hajjaj is that um, in the kind of larger Islamic painting tradition the port city is not a very kind of frequent topic you know when you're looking at the the kind of classic examples of Islamic painting we're very used to looking at the context of the palace you know or the marketplace for instance or the kind of rolling hills of these landscapes but the port city rarely appears. Um, there are a few kind of boat paintings in the Islamic painting tradition, right? Like, uh, um, and there's in fact one that I did not show you from the Indies of Hujaj as well that shows them kind of crossing the uh, Sea of Oman. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's this kind of topic that I think does not appear very frequently. So there's not a lot of cues for how to render um, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of type of, this type of scene. Um, and uh, so I think that one thing that is clear to me is that, um, 
you know, in the particular set of renderings of these port cities, um, there is a desire to see these port cities really through the lens of the pilgrim, not surprisingly, right? Which is why, you know, there's a focus. I mean, we know that all pilgrimage ships that left from Surat and went into the Red Sea. Of course, they were full of passengers, right? And some of them carried hundreds of uh, pilgrims on them. But even the, the ship that had the most passengers had cargo in it, right? Um, you know, but the focus here really is on the pilgrimage rather than the trade, right? And then you look at the kind of Dutch perspective and they're very much focused on this kind of trade angle, right? And on commerce um, uh, beyond, you know, ships as, you know, carriers of people. You don't even see any people in um, some of those earlier uh, images from the Dutch tradition. Um, and uh, at the same time too, I think that there was a point and a goal in um, erasing the European presence, which of course was so prominent by the late 17th century in both Surat and Mocha. Um, and so that is very much a choice. And of course, I should add as well that, um, uh, that Safir and Veli, in his, in his narrative, he talks about the Europeans and he talks about how you want to choose a boat with a European pilot, for instance, right? And, of, and but the artist has not, she's chosen not to render that, right? And I think that that's really important because you then kind of get a view of the port city um, that is um, one that is very much meant to, perspe to present a particular perspective um, on the role of that city, which uh, strips out in many ways, so many of the parts that were of course essential um, to uh, these cities. Um, and you know, so both kind of views, you know, really try to, um, uh, to present certain aspects of this maritime life um, through exclusion as well as inclusion, I would say. Um, so uh, Nancy, there are two questions, and uh, Himangshu has a, a comment which mm -hmm. uh, will turn on the audio for her later on. So the first question uh, is uh, from uh, Elka. Uh, uh, the architectural features on the Gujarati image look as if the viewer might have been expected to turn the image around, uh, but the, the text and the image of the people seem to have clearly oriented the image to one direction. Would the reader be expected to turn the image of Mocha around? Are there examples of images where the text as well in written in different directions? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a uh, that's a great question, Elke. And, you know, I, I will say as well too that I I've realized that when one looks at the images of the Nisfajaj or even the Fatuba Haramein, we you know we kind of wanted to swivel it around and around and around because the, the some of the notes are written in various directions, um, and I'm not talking about the actual text, but I'm talking about the red marginal notes that are meant to as a uh, sort of an identifying feature. Um, and because of that particular idea that I presented about the composite projection, the way when you look at architecture architecture, you know, it's um, kind of merging these various views so that some of the features look like they're moving off in different directions. And um, I do understand that I think for, again, a modern viewer, I think this is quite disorienting. Um, and uh, so I, uh, but I, and so I'm not certain if the viewer would be expected to turn it around necessarily. I think it would be legible to the viewer because indeed, as I've already described, pilgrimage manuals frequently use that mode of representation. Um, and I should also say too, I'm really focusing on the kind of Islamic painting tradition because this is a pilgrimage manual, but when we look across certain Indian provincial painting traditions, particularly the Deccani tradition, you will see lots of these kinds of renderings that give us views of architecture that may not necessarily fit with one single perspective or one single vista as well. So it's definitely, um, you know, uh, in line with, um, with other kinds of painting modes in India. Um, but also remembering too that, um, you know, with, when you're holding a book in your hand, these books, they were um, you know, they were small enough and they, so they could be kind of handled in that way. Um, there were some paintings, not in this book, um, uh, but, uh, you know, in this kind of larger tradition that would be horizontal. And so you would have to swivel the book, the book to be able to see the image um, properly. Um, so, you know, it's definitely possible, um, uh, but indeed, this is a kind, these objects are a kind of object where you have this intimacy with them because of the way you're supposed to hold them. It's very different than, you know, kind of this very detached kind of viewing where you, you know, put the, the book on a desk or for us today where we look at, you know, a screen and we're so kind of far removed from it and, and distant from it. And so um, I think you are just picking up on the intimacy of, um, of these objects as well. Thanks, uh, Nancy. Uh, that answers it. Uh, Erika Mukherjee has a question. Uh, uh, in the Gujarati paintings that you pointed out uh, that the pink color of the buildings uh, indicate that those buildings are a red 
standstone construction. Yeah. In addition to this painting being done in the expectations of a genre, are there additional visual cues that operate as a more sort of one-to-one -one code similar to pink is equal to st standstone? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, I mean, it's funny because, you know, I mean, that's, that is my view, right? There's no, there's no kind of uh, glossary in the, in the painting that indicates that, but it's very clear to me that all of the built cues of that uh, particular manuscript are drawing, not just from local architecture, but from like the monumental tradition of local construction, right? You know, the Pietra Dura, for instance, and red sandstone as kind of, you know, site, trying to elevate these sites as well, right? Uh, because I will tell you, you know, we know that much of Mocha was actually built out of uh, reed and clay, which were quite humble materials, in fact, even though um, some of the biggest buildings were built out of, um, of uh, stone and brick. Um, but I'm trying to think of other of other cues. You know, what is one thing that's very interesting about this larger manuscript, and I didn't have time to show you, it's, it's copiously illustrated, um, is that whereas the architecture is kind of differentiated in that way, uh, or rather where the architecture appears to rather be kind of more generic in that it is you know, very much South Asian, um, regardless of where it's being depicted. Um, and all of those port cities are kind of assimilated to this um, South Asian kind of building mode. Um, the dress in these uh, manuscripts is actually very differentiated, which is so interesting. And so those who are kind of associated with the Ottomans wear little fezes, and those who are not wear turbans. Those who come from the Maghreb or North Africa are shown wearing uh, striped robes. And so it's interesting. There's, you know, kind of differential choices that are being made about what gets to be kind of specific and what is generic, I would say, which I think is really um, interesting, you know, which is unique. And there are a few other, I, I, did, uh, I won't turn the slide back on, but in that one image of, of Jeddah, which is actually quite interesting, there is um, the, the Sanjak Bay of Jeddah, the governor of Jeddah, sits on a golden chair um, and he holds a white porcelain cup with a high foot on it. Um, and I will tell you some of those objects, the golden chair, I've actually written about that pretty extensively, which we see in Mughal painting. And we also see examples of it um, that are related to it in East Africa and, and other parts of the Red Sea, the porcelain cup. I think we might hear a little bit about porcelain tomorrow in our workshop sessions, um, obviously were Indian Ocean products. And so there are some things that are very identifiable um, in these paintings. But the point is that some things are generic and some things are identifiable and, and one needs to kind of have this trained eye to see that it's difficult, I think, for a viewer to pick up on some of these details without having it really kind of pulled apart like that, which is why some of these images can be dangerous when we try to use them to do things that they, um, at least in my view, should not be used to do. And I'm very much responding and trying to talk to some of my colleagues who have tried to, again, see these really as kind of documents, which I do not believe they are, clearly. So Nancy, um, it would be nice to hear from some of these people instead of me uh, asking on their behalf. So Himangshu has a follow-up question. Uh, Himangshu, would you turn on your mic? I think we have allowed you to speak. Um, and, yes. And ask your question. You can turn on your video as well. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, there you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good morning. I, I really enjoyed the talk. And um, I'd like to uh, go back to the point you made, which I thought was really fascinating about the tower and how the European ships had to orient themselves to enter the port. Uh, now, this is something that we find at you know, several other sites where these towers are depicted, particularly in, uh, you know, in, in, in your, and also descriptions where they talk about towers and they seem to be sort of really obsessed about having these towers. Well, we don't see the tower in, in the other paintings, in the Gujarati paintings that you showed us. Now, um, can we read that maybe uh, the Gujarati ships had a better idea or they used, um, you know, uh, different uh, ways? I mean, uh, how, far can we, how far can we read into this uh, difference? And, uh, you know, if you'd like to comment on that. But thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased to see you here. And uh, I really appreciate the comments and, uh, and the gracious reception. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I will say um, that, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, you know, it's obvious that for them, that was such a main navigational point. Um, and it, because it is not only depicted, but it's also described very clearly in the text. And, you know, and this is not the only one. 
many of the texts of Mocha describe that as one of the first things exactly how you have to get into it because of the fact that the harbor was the kind of crescent shape. It closed in a little bit. It was particularly dangerous. And I should also add, of course, as I think many people know, the Red Sea is a very difficult sea to navigate, which is one of the reasons why many would stop at Mocha and then they would drop their goods there and get out of that sea because you know they knew that they wanted to leave the interior traffic to those local and smaller ships that knew the coastline better because it was uh, so dangerous because of the coral reefs and the shoals and, and so forth. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, that's one of the uh, you know really um, uh, important features. And I will tell you just because this is kind of interesting, I know there's some people who are interested in Surat here. Um, and that tower was so important that, um, uh, and you know, we believe it dates from the, from the 50, uh, from the uh, six, 16th century, excuse me, the late 16th century. Um, but then in the early 18th century, uh, Muhammad Ali, the, um, the heir of the Surati magnate uh, Abdul Ghafur, uh, when he came into the Red Sea, um, he actually paid to sponsor to have that minaret rebuilt. And so what we see there today, I did not show you the, the, the current state of that minaret, but he rebuilt it because, you know, uh, for, you know, this was an act of patronage, but of course he knew that every Everyone was using that as a navigational tool, right? And so even the Europeans were coming in and using that tower that he, um, you know, contributed to the rebuilding of. And so one can see that as a really kind of powerful symbol of someone like Muhammad Ali. Of course, he died like four years after that. And so that was the end of, of you know, his, of, of, of his uh, kind of meteoric rise. Um, but uh, yeah, so absolutely, that was a really key point that I, what I guess I'm trying to say is that if someone like Muhammad Ali is interested in it as well, then this is also something that, the, that a Gujarati merchant is very, very concerned with too, right? So, so, um, so we can see that on both sides um, very obviously. Um, but then in the depiction, um, yeah, I, I just thought it's so interesting. And again, there's a lot of confusion that people have about these two buildings, the tomb, which is quite small and obviously domed, and the um, and then the mosque, which of course you know, has a minaret and is much bigger and actually had nine domes. Um, and so it's just fascinating that, you know, because that, that structure is labeled in the Gujarati painting Gumbad, right, which is really referring to the dome, and, you know, to the tomb rather than the um, than the mosque, and it just to me gives you a sense of again this kind of selectivity about trying to represent Mocha as a pilgrimage site, right, rather than as this commercial site. Even though again we know that the Gujarati pilgrims who would come in those ships were as engaged in, in trade as others were, but that's not the depiction that we see there, which is so interesting. And if I could just tell you one very sad story though, is that um, I'm sure everyone knows that. Um, Yemen is in the midst of a very, very uh, catastrophic and continuing war right now, um, and that so much of its heritage has been damaged, um, some of it uh, as collateral damage and airstrikes, and some of it um, purposefully, unfortunately. Um, and uh, the, those two buildings, the mosque and tomb, that had you know, stood for hundreds of years, um, uh, were affected recently. Uh, both of them were uh, kind of damaged a little bit by some of the air strikes, but um, the tomb was willfully destroyed by those who uh, came into the city. We don't know the exact circumstances, but that was in the year 2017. So that tomb, which is the oldest building in Mocha, no longer stands. And of course it was a tomb to coffee because uh, of the legacy of that individual and his, uh, you know, I will say his legendary role in the coffee um, uh, uh, as a, the first consumer of coffee. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. We, we have three more questions uh, on the Q&A box. Uh, we may have time for two more. Uh, so if you are planning to ask questions, you can just uh, type those uh, there. And I might ask you to just speak up. So uh, Diane Butler has the next question. Uh, Diane, would you like to speak up or do you want me to read it for you? Why don't you speak up, Diane? Um, I, I can't remember exactly how I phrased it. it you're welcome to read it for you. Please do. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the European prince have uh, an implied witness in quotations viewing mocha from the sea. Is there a sense of a presence in the Indian manuscripts? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the fact that, you know, it's, it's really interesting, the fact that the, all of those people that he that he met, and they were the notables of the city, were not just depicted, but were labeled, 
that's really important. So that I, I think I showed you the governor of this uh, Syed Hassan, he's called. Um, and again, I know about him because he appears in other sources um, and we know that he was a governor at that moment. Um, and he's shown on horseback, which is really important, right? And as well as the governor of Jeddah, who was not named, he was just named um, by his position, not his, um, uh, not his actual name, by his title only. But the fact that he was sitting on that kind of golden throne as well. This was not only Safi bin Vali as the witness, because he's not in there. I mean, he's not in there but we do see the people that he met and that he mentions and talks about in the text. Um, but the fact that he shows them and he labels them so that we, can, we know that he was really there, I think was a, it was a major goal of the artist probably, you know, and it's possible that, um, you know, some say that it is possible that all of the manuscripts were produced actually in the same uh, workshop and some have even proposed that Safi bin Vali might have been involved in kind of, you know, dictating work. That's hard to say because we don't have evidence to that. Uh, point, but um, but in many ways, this is meant to glorify his position as not only the, the successful pilgrim, because remember, not everyone made the pilgrimage successfully, and when you you know when you did do so successfully, you gained religious merit, but also just by showing these people that were met and encountered along the way. I um, mean, there are other historic figures as well, like the um, Amir al Hajj from Egypt, the one the person who was supposed to organize a pilgrimage from Egypt. Uh, the Sharif of Mecca is a very important person, also. All of these individuals are shown and they are labeled so that we kind of get the sense of, you know, like his presence there. He was really there, right? And um, so I think that's a very important part of uh, those paintings. So the next question, uh, Nancy, is, is from uh, Sarah Brooker, who is our uh, student at NYU Shanghai. So Sarah, you want to speak up? Um, sure. Uh, yeah. My question was, um, who would have been able to purchase and access these images and would they have been like borrowed and passed around and so multiple people would have seen the same copy or would they have been, um, would somebody have been able to purchase their own copy and keep it and look at it for a really long time? Um, so uh, Sarah, were you referring to the Dutch images or the Indian ones? Both. Both, okay. So um, yeah, so I mean, with the Dutch ones, we can understand um, that these books, uh, especially like the first version of Vandenberg's narrative is tiny, like it's a really small book and the print kind of fills up the whole page. Um, and it was printed again by two printers. Um, you know, we can imagine that someone, I wouldn't say someone who was of the lowest kind of ranks of society could afford it, but I think someone who is kind of middling could afford it, right? And we saw that they kept on producing them and they kept on finding ways to produce those books that were cheaper, which is what I was trying to get at when I talked about the ways that they were printing them and they were uh, trying to kind of make shortcuts and, you know, um, and cut corners in terms of the printing so that they could be more affordable. So um, indeed, you know, uh, there's a difference though between that big compendium I was talking about that had two volumes, that had all of the narratives and then the single little volume that only had one narrative, which is obviously going to be cheaper. And you can see that the fact that they're making these different um, kind of versions of the books means that there were people at different levels of society and different kinds of status who wanted these kinds of books. And if they couldn't afford the big, expensive, huge one, they could afford the small one, right? And so you can see that, the, you know, all these different groups are being catered to by those different formats, which is really important. And, you know, and so, so I think that there was a, a relative amount of circulation within the Dutch Dutch sphere, um, especially because of those options. In the context of the Indian sphere, um, like I said, I believe that would keep out of a commercial workshop. It definitely did not come out of an imperial workshop by that point in the late 17th century. Um, a lot of the workshops, the Indian workshops, had sl uh, the imperial workshop had slowed down under the patronage of the Mughal ruler Aurangzeb, who was not as much into painting as some of his uh, predecessors were. Um, and uh, but a, a full illustrated, handwritten, painted workshop that might even include some gold in it would be expensive. And so, by contrast, whereas we have lots of copies of those books that I just described to you in the in the Dutch context, we only have three extant illustrated manuscript copies of the Ennis of Hujaj. There, there may have been more, but you know, and survival rate is hard. It's hard to say, well, that means that we you know, only had a smaller number, um, but we know that just the kind of care of producing a book, you know, writing it by hand, rendering every image by hand, these are much more intensive processes. And so that would have been a much smaller group. Um, than what than the circulation. So yeah, we definitely that is uh, I think uh, an important difference in terms of reception and audience that um, that I did not get to mention. So thank you for um, asking that question. 
So, uh, Nancy, uh, one final question from Li Ling Ting. Uh, Li Ling, do you want to ask the question? Sure. Um, dear Professor Ong, um, thank you so much for the talk. And this is really comforting while I can't actually go to, you know, a museum to see all these paintings. Um, so I'm interested in the calligraphy found in the South Asian paintings. Can you talk a little bit um, about that? And does it provide, you know, an alternative narrative in addition to the um, images that we see? Yes, yes, thank absolutely. You. Yeah, thank you. And so, um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like, well, like I said, we've got, well, first of all, you've got this, um, the manuscript, the Khalili collection is not complete. Um, so we don't have all of the folios. We know that there's some missing pages. Um, and there are a few versions as well of this manuscript that are also defective that sit in, um, that are not illustrated, that sit in various collections. So there's, you know, there's a whole range of different, different manuscripts that have different uh, differences between them, I will say, which is important to understand. Um, but uh, so um, in terms of the text, you know, we have the text and the image is one thing. In terms of the calligraphy, you know, these were, uh, you know, written with someone who had, you know, a fairly learned hand in black, right? And so you saw the text was written in black. Um, and on the mocha image, there's one little line of text. But in most cases, most of the pages would be fully written out, and then the image would occupy almost a full page, sometimes would share some room with text. Um, and uh, so the scribe we, is, was usually different than the artist who rendered the paintings, I will say, which is important to understand. But then as one more wrinkle, as you saw on the paintings in red, there were also inscriptions also in Persian. Um, and then the question is who did those? Was that the scribe or was that the artist? Um, and that we are not certain about either. And um, so um, it's possible that there could have been as many as two, maybe even three hands involved. And I should also add, I did say the artist, the artist in kind of singular terms, but um, we also know that um, you know these workshops often would have several people working on a work uh, on a particular manuscript, um, and so it may have been the case that there was a small team of artists who were working on those paintings as well. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that much information about it. One of the um, uh, one of the manuscripts, which is the one that is in Mumbai. Um, uh, in the former Prince of Wales Museum, uh, is um, uh, does have the name of an artist who simply goes by Ustez, which is not very useful because that just means like the master. It's kind of more of a title than a name. So, um, so there are questions, um, uh, and indeed there's layers of text as well. Um, and I will tell you though that those. The, the manuscript text pages are, you know, they are rarely talked about. And this is one of the things when you have an art historian to deal with manuscript, they often like to talk about the images rather than the text. And so we sometimes have a hard time even getting our hands on the, uh, on the text part portion. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, and thank you for the, for the talk today. It was really exciting. And all the people who showed up and asked questions, uh, I thank you all, thank all of you. Uh, so I'll give Selena the final word uh, as the interim director of the center. She would she should formally thank you uh, for joining us and staying awake uh, until quite late, it seems. Uh, so Selena. Uh, I'll just say that thank you, Nancy and Tenzin, for this wonderful talk and conversation. Thanks everyone okay, to, for participating in this event. Uh, as I have said and at the beginning, the center will continue to have several more webinars in November and December and definitely in the spring semester as well. So please stay tuned. Uh, we'll see you next month. Uh, one thing I should add uh, behind Selena is uh, our new campus that's coming up. So those of you who do not know how NYU Shanghai looks like, it does not look like that as of now, but uh, two years from now, uh, that will be our new building. Uh, it looks quite fancy. <laughs> yes. Here's a preview. <laughs> yes, it's a preview. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Nancy, one more time. And to everybody, Selena, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.